Good evening to everyone. I praise God. I don't know if those who are listening was able to hear that song. Um, that song is so near and dear to my heart. The song says, I give myself away. And so, um, so often we come to Christ and uh, we realize we need him. But oftentimes we try to hold on to pieces, different parts of our life. And we give up some things, but we don't give up everything. But I just want to encourage everyone, you know, as, as you sit under the sound of my voice, as we live day by day and we proclaim um, to be believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, I just want to encourage us all to give over every single area um, of your life to him. Um, allow him to be Lord and to rule and to reign in every single thing. Um, and I tell you, you will experience um, a peace and a joy that you've never experienced before. You can experience um, a true um, belonging in the body of Christ, um, a, a feeling of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not feeling lost, but um, f feeling like you have purpose. That's the word I'm looking for. That purpose is there. Because we have to realize that, you know, the word says we can't serve two masters. And if we're going to call Christ our master, um, when we follow him, we have to know that we're going somewhere. Sometimes that journey can get weary along the way in our flesh because we don't understand the route that God has taken us on. And we don't understand why we may have to go through the things that we have to go through to get there. But I just want to encourage you to trust in the God that you serve. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because one thing we have to understand is that he is all-knowing. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and he knows every single um, thing that we need to go through to mature us. He knows exactly what he needs to allow us to go through. He knows um, what it's going to take to get us to where he needs us to be so that he can use us, so that he can be glorified. And so I just want to encourage us tonight to really and truly examine ourselves and ask ourselves, you know, have I really given this over to the Lord, whatever it may be? Sometimes it's finances. Sometimes it's just direction about education. Sometimes it might be about a job. Sometimes it might be about a family member who needs to be saved. Sometimes it's those things that's in our heart and in our life that maybe for whatever reason, and we can't let go of. But I just really want to encourage us tonight, and I can't even say it enough, to really allow Jesus Christ to rule and reign in everything. Don't attempt to do anything without consulting with him because he knows um, the answer to everything. He knows the dangers that lie ahead. He knows what obstacles we're going to face, and he knows how to prepare us for those things. And not only does he know how to prepare us for the obstacles, but he knows how to prepare us for the victory so that we can continue to walk in humility and not get prideful and not get big-headed about the things that he might bless us with or how he might choose to use us. And so let us just allow him to be who he is and allow him to be head, allow him to be Lord, allow him to be master, allow him to be king in every single thing, in everything in our life. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, we glorify you um, because of who you are. And God, as we stand before you tonight, we have so many things to be thankful for, Lord. We thank you, dear God, first and foremost, for life, Lord, for salvation. God, we thank you for renewing our mind and our heart. God, we thank you so much for giving us a heart to worship you, not just with our lips, Lord, but with our life. And Heavenly Father, as we come before you, God, we know that there are some things, Lord, that may not be pleasing to you, Lord God, even if it's just in our thoughts. But right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just say that we release those things to you, God, and we ask that you will allow your word to come in and clean us up, Lord God. We confess to you right now, dear God, that we need you. We can't do anything without you. And we believe and stand on your word, Lord God, that without you, we can do nothing. That's what you told us in John chapter 15, Lord. We need you, dear God, to steer us 
in this life, Lord God, to lead us and guide us in the direction that you want us to go. Oftentimes, Lord God, we fall victim to our flesh, Lord God, and we succumb to the things that we're uh, accustomed to, Lord God. Sometimes we follow after the things that seem familiar to us, Lord. God, forgive us for following after our flesh and for following after our own desires, Lord. But right now, Lord God, we just come before you saying that we need you. And we ask, dear God, that you would have your way, Lord God. We come before you. We surrender to you right now, Lord God, mind, body, and soul, asking, Lord, that you would be glorified through us, Lord God. Not only as we gather together in your name, Lord God, but as we go about our life in different places, Lord God. Use us, Lord, in the shopping center, Lord God, on our jobs, in the classrooms, wherever we may go, Lord God. There may be somebody near us that we can tell about you, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to not get so caught up in our own life, Lord God, that we forget about the lost souls that are out there. Dear God, we come together tonight knowing that you have a word for us, Lord, and we come prepared to hear from you, Lord. The enemy wished to bring a lot of things to distract us, God, but we just come right now making a sound decision, Lord, that we want to hear from you. Not only tonight, God, but every day of our life, Lord God, we make a sound decision to submit ourselves to you, Lord God, and do just as your word says, submitting ourselves to you so that we can resist the devil. And we just come right now, Lord, asking that you will speak clearly. Give us an understanding of your word on tonight, Lord God, and give us the strength and power to live it day by day. Speak through your servant tonight, Lord God. Have your way. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. We thank God for those words of exhortation. And we pray that, uh, that uh, what was said will be given heed. We also thank God for everyone that have joined us today for this uh, time of fellowship. Uh, those that uh, have joined us here locally who are with us. Those who are also listening online and those who are watching live. <clears throat> we thank God for you and we always pray for you that uh, the Lord will continue to say things that will be a blessing to you and uh, he will continue to, um, to uh, admonish you to keep his word. And that is what we're here for, is uh, to have a relationship with God, our creator. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I, we have uh, seven children and we, we could not imagine what it would feel like to have children who... Uh, and, and to be responsible for them being on this earth, but to not have a relationship with them, or them not to talk to us on a regular basis, you see, or them to just ignore us, you see, that would be very heartbreaking uh, to have children that, that uh, ignore you, that treat you like you don't exist, that treat you like you didn't have anything to do with them being here, that... Uh, really uh, you have their best interest in mind but will do just the opposite just out of spite and uh, that would be a heartbreaking thing you see and but just imagine how how God must feel to be a, the creator of everyone that's walking this earth and yet he get ignored every day you see ignored every day people uh, don't acknowledge his existence even though he's the reason why they're existing at any time, uh, God can snap his finger and all of mankind uh, would, would cease to exist, you see. But uh, that's not so. His love and his mercy is why we're still here, you see. His love and his mercy. When I was in the fourth grade, uh, my teacher, uh, Mrs. Johnson, she, we were learning about molecules at that time uh, in our science class. And uh, as she was teaching it, she said that molecules are always moving around, always moving around. That's why we're able to move. And she said if molecules ever stopped moving, then life as we know it would cease. Nobody would be able to breathe. Nobody would be able to live if molecules stopped moving, you see. And I thought at that time, look at how much power God has, that at any time he could speak and just stop molecules from moving. And, and that would be the end of us. That would be it. We have no idea how vulnerable we are, mm -hmm. you see. If we ever wake up and see just how vulnerable we are and how much we really have to depend on God, then we'd love him more. You see, we'd, we'd give him more attention. But when we think 
that uh, at nighttime we set our alarm clock and that's what wake us up. And uh, when we think that if I just stay in good shape, then I'll be in good shape and I can do whatever I need to do. Uh, when we think it's about us, then we're in trouble, you see. And, and that's exactly when we begin to ignore God is when we think that it's, it's just us. When we think that, uh, you know, that we're the ones that's doing it. The Bible lets us know that it's in him that we move, that we live, we, that we breathe and we have our being. It's in him that we do that, not outside of him. And God wake people up that will blaspheme him all day long. God wake killers up every day. He wake child molesters up. You know, even though he knows what they're going to go out and do, he wake thieves up. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he wake those people up that hate his name. He wake them up, giving them another chance. Let's not take that for granted. Let's see. Let's not take that for granted because the day will come uh, <laughs> where that mercy will, will run out. If we continue to take him for granted, uh, it'll run out, you see. And we'll find out the hard way. Uh, when you reject love, there's nothing else for you but judgment. You see, when you reject that love. And people that have a problem with this idea of an of a, a eternal burning leg of fire, and they don't believe that a loving God can allow people to go there. You see, that's why we have some denominations who teach different. Well, I don't believe that God will send people to hell. And, uh, of course, I'll agree with you. God don't send anybody to hell. You choose to go there. And then you don't, you got those people that say, well, I don't believe that God would make a, make a lake of fire and, and people go there. I just don't believe that a loving God could do that. But listen, it's easy for us to believe that God sent his son to, and poured his wrath out on his son for our sakes. Mm -hmm. And so that same God, that when, here's the thing, we choose to be the, the children of wrath. We choose wrath. Why? Because when God poured out his judgment upon his son, in other words, his wrath upon his son, it was meant to take away the sins of the world, to take that judgment. The Lord took that judgment upon himself. And when we reject what the Lord have done for us, what we're telling God is, well, I'll just take it upon myself. I'll take my own judgment. I'll pay my, for my own sins. I'll pay my own way. And the Lord will let you have at it, have at it you see. If, if you reject what the Lord did as far as taking our punishment for sins, then you, what you're doing is volunteering to receive your own punishment. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and what can God do but allow you to do that? You see, so let's not take that for granted. Amen. Now, we, we studied, uh, we began a uh, series called God's uh, Rod of Correction. Again, we want to point out that idea that it's called a rod of correction. Uh, when God uses his rod is to correct people is is less for punishment and is more for correction. You see, uh, what does he do? God, just like any other parent, uh, he don't spank his children for nothing. Uh, there's a reason for it, you see. And so if you're being a good child, if you're walking in obedience, you don't have to worry about getting chastised. But when you begin to walk outside of God's word, then then, of course, that chastisement come and the Lord said whom I love I chasten you see and so he chastens us because he loves us because he don't want to see us continue to walk down that wrong path amen so if you have your Bibles let's go to the 11th chapter of the book of 2nd Samuel I think it was last week uh, that we looked at Saul and as we've stated before in this series uh, our attitude towards the chastisement and the correction of God will always determine how far along we grow. You see, sometimes people don't grow because they refuse to receive that chastisement of the Lord. Sometimes people don't grow because of their attitude towards that chastisement. Just like a rebellious child, uh, you can spank a child when they're little, and if they don't learn to receive correction, uh, they will grow up and become adults that you can't tell anything, you see. Grown folks, uh, just like children that, that can't be told anything, uh, won't, don't want to learn anything, because it started when they were little. Uh, they didn't receive the chastisement of the parents, of the elders, or whatever the case is, and so they, they grow up with, with, with rebellion in them. See, that rebellion just don't come there when they become teenagers. It starts when they're small. And so you have to teach your children how to receive 
chastisement. In other words, you know, the Bible says the rod and reproof. You see, the rod and reproof. So not just spanking them with the rod, but reproving them, letting them know why they're getting spanked and why, uh, you know, because you expect more out of them, you see. And that is the way God is. He expects more out of us uh, when we walk the wrong path. And so he, he brings that rod and he brings that reproof to help us to grow, you see. That's because he loves us. And that's, and that's one thing that we want to really hit home is... We're chastised because we're loved. And so let, let's try to develop a, the right attitude. Saul lost the kingdom of Israel because he didn't receive God's correction. Uh, first of all, he was denying it. Uh, when, when Samuel went to him to confront him about not being completely obedient to the Lord, he denied that and said, yeah, I, I did everything God told me to do. And, and then as Samuel kept bringing it up, what did he do? He blamed it on the people. Well, the people, they brought up the, the best of the sheep and oxen. They're the ones that did it. You see, in other words, they didn't, he didn't want to take responsibility. Now, you'll never grow in the Lord if you don't learn to take responsibility for what you do. You see, as long as it's everybody else's fault, you'll never grow. You'll never grow. You see, and so, <clears throat> so after that, uh, finally he said, okay, yeah, I, you got me, I sinned, but honor me, turn and, and worship the Lord with me and honor me before the people, honor. So what was, he, what was his main thing? He was living for people. He was concerned about his reputation. He did not want to humble himself before the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I messed up. Will you please forgive me? It wasn't that. It was, okay, I'll admit that what I did, but I still want to look good in front of the people, which shows that he wasn't, walking in humility. And because of that, God took the kingdom from him and, and God said, I'm gonna give this kingdom to us, to uh, 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 your neighbor that's better than you. Now he was talking about King David. And so here tonight, this is who we're gonna look at, King David. And we're gonna look at why God said David was better than him. It wasn't because David didn't make mistakes as we're about to read, you see. It was because of how he received correction. He was able to grow. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. You see, he was a special somebody, not because he never messed up, not because he never made a mistake. But when he did, he was walking in humility. He, he humbled himself. All right. <clears throat> so most of us who are listening tonight, we know the story of David. Uh, he he. Um, Gazed out one day and, and saw this woman taking a bath. And uh, he called for the woman and they ended up sleeping together. Unfortunately, she was somebody else's wife, uh, one of David's generals, his wife. And so they slept together. And then the woman let him know that she was pregnant with his child. And so what did David do? Uh, he called for the army to come off the battlefield and tried to get Uriah, which was the woman's husband, Bathsheba, tried to get him to go sleep with his wife so that he would think it was his baby. Mm -hmm. So Uriah was a man of honor. And he said, there's no way I'm going to do that when my men are out there, you know, sleeping in tents. I'm not going to go into the comfort of my own house. And so Uriah slept in the doorway of the, of the palace instead of sleeping inside and having the luxury of being with his wife. And so then David had to do something else. Now at the beginning, we see David is constantly trying to cover his sin. And that's what happens when we don't confess our sins. Either we're going to cover it or we're going to let the Lord, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cover it. You see? And so he tried to cover his sins. And then when he couldn't do that, what did he do? Uh, he, he called for his, gener his other general and said, look, uh, in the heat of the battle, you put Uriah out front and perhaps he'll be killed. And so that's what happened. Uh, they saw the opportunity there. They put Uriah out front in the heat of the battle. And Uriah was killed. And so this is where we pick up at. This is where we pick up at in this story. All right. Second uh, Samuel, we're at chapter 11 of Second Samuel. We're going to start reading at verse 26. It says, and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past... David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife. 
and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something that while all of this is going on, God didn't say anything. Not one word that he say. You see, God was standing there when 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 David slept with Bathsheba. He was there when David tried to cover it by getting Uriah to go sleep with his wife so he would think that that was his baby. He, he watched all of this go on. You see, he watched it all go on and, and he'll do the same for us. He will watch us make a wrong turn, watching us to see if we're going to to uh, turn our hearts back towards him. God doesn't want to come chasing us down. We should be chasing the Lord down, you see. But unfortunately, what happens is what we read in the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Ecclesiastes real quick. All right, the eighth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to just read one verse. Eighth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to read verse 11. And, and this is the core of, of people. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, because we, don't, we think we done got away a few times, we're doing something. It's, it, what, what, the, <laughs> what Solomon is saying is, because we think we've gotten away with something, because God doesn't come down and, and strike us every time we do something wrong, because of his mercy and his long suffering, we don't run to the Lord and say, Lord, I see that you're merciful. Forgive me and let, help me to turn. No. We think, well, I'm getting away with it. Or maybe this is God's stamp of approval. Or maybe sin is not such a big deal after all. It says it's set in the hearts of men to continue to do evil. Mm -hmm. You see, that's the nature of people. That is the nature of people. That's the nature that we're born with. That, that nature that says, well, you know, God haven't come down yet. He hasn't done anything yet. I, I can keep doing this. I can keep doing it. Mm -hmm. David was trying to cover his sin. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you see. In the Garden of Eden, when mankind did what they did as far as uh, disobeying God and eating of that tree, the Bible says that when Adam ate of that tree, they were ashamed because they knew that they were naked. And instead of them going to God, what did they do? They went and they sewed some fig leaves together and tried to cover their own sins. And ever since then, men have been sewing fig leaves, trying to cover their sins. You know, <laughs> but God sees it all. Ain't no use in us, you know, no use in us trying to cover anything. God knew they were naked. He, he didn't care how many fig leaves they had got together there. You see, he knew that they were naked. He knew what condition they were in, you see. And let's not wait until, until uh, we, we think it's got to the point where God has found us out and all of a sudden it's all coming apart and our whole lives are unraveling. That's what the devil wants. He, he wants he want you to wait until that point where everything is coming apart before you finally confess it to God. See, God wants you to confess it because he wants to fix what's going wrong. You see, it's just like a vehicle. Uh, you can drive a vehicle. Uh, you, you may hear a little tick, tick, tick noise. And you think, well, you know, it, this is fine. I just keep riding. It's still driving, so we'll just keep riding. And then before you know that ticking turns to knocking. Then before you know it, you got a rod sitting on the street somewhere because you you've thrown, thrown a rod, what they call throwing a rod, and, and you've destroyed your engine. What happens, sometimes people, they ride their vehicle, they ride their vehicle, and they keep riding it down, keep riding it down, and, and the next thing you know, it's just completely destroyed where you can't use it anymore. That's the way the devil wants to work in your life. When you first hear that little ticking noise, the best thing for you to do is take it to the shop. Why? Because you can do a lot of damage control by addressing the issue when it, when you first, when it first comes up. And that's the way God wants to be in our lives. When we see something, 
in ourselves that's not like God, you see. God wants us to come to him, and, and he, he wants us to confess these things to him so that, and be honest about it, you see. But again, it takes humility to be that way. Amen. Now let's go back to the, uh, the book of 2 Samuel, and we'll pick up uh, at, at chapter 12. Amen. So Uriah have been killed. Uh, his wife have mourned him. And now David have taken his wife to be his own wife. All right. Chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. We'll start reading at verse 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, and one rich, and, and the other poor. Now who did God send to David? A prophet. Now, the Bible says that David himself was a prophet, you see. But God had to send David a prophet to, to warn him. Again, that's, that's why the word of God lets us know, touch not my anointing, do my prophets no harm. It don't say do my pastors no harm. It said do my prophets no harm. Because prophets are sent to correct people, you see. So that, that, that ministry is not an easy ministry, you see. It's not an easy ministry. Amen. All right, verse 2 says, the rich man had, had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him a daughter. You see, now this is, this is what, they, what, what the prophet Nathan is doing is trying to show David, how precious this little lamb was to, this, to, to the owner here, you see. Verse 4, And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the way, wayfaring man that was come un, unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Verse 5, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall, shall surely die. That's why we better be careful. Jesus Christ said when he was in this earth, by our words we'll be justified and by our words we will be condemned. You see, so we better be careful. Verse 6, and, and here's the thing, David couldn't see his own self. Mm -hmm. See, you're in trouble when you get to the point where you can't see yourself. He could see somebody else, you know, no, that was wrong, but he couldn't see himself, that he was the man in the story. Verse 6, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. You see how prophets have to be just right in his face. Now, David, again, we'll point out these kings in, these, in the Bible, they were absolute rulers. They weren't presidents where they had to get Congress to pass all of these laws, they were the law, you see. They could have you killed or they could, they could have you exhorted, you see. And so they were absolute rulers. Now you think about what this prophet must have been thinking to stand before David and tell him, you're the man. He had to be bold to do that. You're the man, David, even at the risk of losing his own life. He had to tell David what his sins were, you see. All right. And, and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. In other words, David, I've given you a lot. I've given you, and, and, if, and if that wasn't enough, all you had to do was ask, and I'd have given you more. Let's keep reading here. Now, this is God's way of telling us, you come out of that world, because I have a whole kingdom for you to live in. Amen. You see? This world is not going to satisfy you, Amen. Christians. You're supposed to walk according to, to the ways that God has given you to walk. And so he's telling us, you come out of the world. Don't, don't be a part of the world. You do what I've called you to do, you see. And, and if you think that what you don't have or what you have is not enough, I will give you more, but don't you live according to the ways of this world. And so God is calling us out of the world, you see. So in other words, there's no excuse, you see. There's no excuse. Amen. Let's go ahead and keep reading here. <clears throat> 
Verse 9 says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You see how God called it out and he, and he called it exactly what it was? David thought he was being slick. We'll just put him in the heat of the battle and it'll look like I, I ain't got nothing to do with his death. He just got caught up. But God said, you killed him, David, and you used the sword of Ammon to do it. That means we can't outslick God. Amen. You see, we can't get around sin and make excuses for it. And we can't justify it. We cannot outslick God. God knows our motives. He knows the Bible says that the heart is deceptive above all. Who can know it? That's why I don't go along with people. Well, God knows my heart. He knows your heart because your actions follow what's in your heart. Amen. Your mouth is going to say what's in your heart. Amen. And so, yes, God knows your heart because it's, it, it comes out in your actions and out of your mouth. That's according to the word of God. About Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, he said adultery, fornication, lying, all of these things, they come from the heart. It's so it's what's in a man mm -hmm. that defiles him. Right. It's what comes out of him. In other words, not what goes in him, not food that defile him, but what comes out of him, because what comes out of him proceeds out of his heart. You see? Amen. So we, we can't outslick God. We just have to be humble and admit these things. Verse 10 says, Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. You see how God took it personal? He didn't tell David, look, you go over there and you apologize to your rise family for what you done done. And God said, no, you despise me. The same way <clears throat> he approached Saul when Saul was persecuting the church. Jesus took it personal and said, no, I'm the one you're persecuting, Saul. Your issue is with me. So let me say this again. Mm -hmm. When you have a sin problem, you got a God problem. Mm -hmm. you, you got sin in your life because you got issues with God. You see, that's why sin is still there. You see, your problem isn't with the preacher it's, it's with God. And so when sin is there, God's not there. Your issue is with God. You have a problem with his word, with his pure word. You see? All right. Verse 10 says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus said the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. So in other words, you're going to reap what you sow, David. And you read, you read on down through that. He definitely reaped what he sowed. He definitely reaped what he sowed. All right, let's keep reading here. Verse 12, for thou didst it secretly. You see that? Now, he's not saying you hid it from me, David, because of course we can't hide anything from God. What he's saying is, David, you were trying to be sneaky about it. And nobody knew about it but me. And the prophet that I revealed it to. You try to be sneaky with it. He says, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. You see, that same God that see you doing all of those little sneaky things in private. He'll expose it. He'll expose it. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Why, why did David receive mercy? Because he confessed his sins. He didn't say, well, Lord, she, she shouldn't have been on that roof taking a bath anyway. Amen. Uh, folks will find all kind of excuses to sin, you see. Uh, she shouldn't have been doing that. And you're right, he should have been looking after his wife. He ain't had no business. Out. He should have been taking care of her. And the devil give us all kind of excuses. Mm -hmm. But David, he confessed. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. And because he confessed, Nathan was able to respond with, the Lord have put away your sin. Now, I want you to notice, what did he mean by that? What we read in the last part of that verse, thou shalt not die. He, didn't, he wasn't talking about, okay, God, you don't have to pay for it now, David. I've put it away. The Lord have put it away. You don't know. David still had to reap what he sowed. Verse 14 says, how be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child 
also that is born unto thee shall surely die. That's the key right there. If you want to grow in the Lord, you better know this verse. It says, because you have given the enemies of the Lord great occasion to blaspheme. I got to deal with you, David. When we love God, God wants us to get to the point where we love him enough so that our life is a testimony, so that we live in integrity, so that we don't bring a reproach on him, Amen. so that we don't make him look bad, so that the enemies of the Lord can't point the finger and say, there's another hypocrite. Amen. You see, that's God's concern. That's God's concern, not your, about your feelings being hurt, but about his name, his name, you see. And God wants us to get to a point where before we make any decisions, we think not how much I can get away with Lord, but God, how much, what is this going to make you look like? How is this going to bring honor or dishonor to you or to your name? You see, how is this going to affect you? Is what I'm doing going to cause somebody else to miss you? Is what I'm doing going to cause somebody else to stumble and, and to lose their salvation or even reject salvation? You see, that's what God is concerned about. Amen. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. And it was very sick. Like we said last time we were up here, the Lord still strike people. Uh, I know there are false, a lot of false prophets up saying, Lord, don't make nobody sick. The Lord don't. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Now, God's word is not going to change because people want to make God into some fluffy somebody. The Bible says that God struck that child. What does that mean? God is not going to bless sin. That child represented sin. Now, I'm going to tell you why God chastises us. It's because he wants everybody else to know that you, he's holy and you can't live unholy and get away with it. Amen. It's just like a child. If you got more than one child, that oldest child, you make an example out of that oldest child. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? That oldest child gets to cutting up. You spank his behind. And so the rest of them will see, look, this is what you get when you cut up. In the Old Testament, whenever children were rebellious, they didn't send them off to camp somewhere or to somebody's Bible study. They took them out of the city at God's command. They took them outside of the city and they stoned them to death. Why? Because they wanted the other children to see. This is what God thinks about rebellion. You see that? But when, when Korah and his company decided to rebel against uh, Moses. Really what they were doing was rebelling against God. They wanted uh, Aaron's position and they wanted Moses's position, mm -hmm. even though they were already Levites and already in the service of the Lord. They stepped outside uh, of the of the parameter that God had set for them in ministry mm -hmm. and decided, well, we'll gather people to our own selves. The Bible says that God came down and split the earth open mm -hmm. and they went into hell alive. They didn't die. So many people say, well, there's only two men that never died. Uh, Elijah and, and Enoch. No, it's more than that. It's just Elijah and Enoch went where God is. <laughs> Cor and his company, which were hundreds of them, they went into hell alive. The Bible says that when the children of Israel saw that, they took off running. Why? Because that's what God thinks about rebellion. That's what he thinks about rebellion. That spirit of rebellion, as the Bible says in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, chapter, is as the spirit of witchcraft. And that word says you should not suffer a witch to live. You see that? God hates rebellion. Why? Because that's what brought the devil along. The devil rebelled. Lucifer rebelled you see so he hates rebellion and, and so if, if he cast lucifer out of heaven 
then what makes you think you're going to mosey yourself to heaven with all that rebellion? Uh, you won't. Amen. You see, he hates rebellion. All right, let's keep reading here. Verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? In other words, we're scared to tell him because he's already looking like he's suicidal. Ain't no telling what he's going to do if he find out this child is dead. Okay, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 19, But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He didn't get bitter, shake his face, fist at God. And that's what people do today when God chastises them. They can't stand God. Uh, how can you allow this to happen? See, if David had been like that, he never would have realized he was the one that brought that child's death. Amen. It wasn't God's fault. He, he's the one that produced that. You see? You see how important it is for us to receive our chastisement with grace? Instead of shaking our fist at God, let's look at what we did to bring it on. You see? It says he worshiped. Last part of verse 20 says, Then he, he came to his own house, and when he required... They set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. You see that? You see how he received it? Even when God struck his child, to where that child died, he got up out of that slump that he was in, you know, and praying and fasting and asking the Lord to help the child, and he went right to the house of the Lord, and he began to worship. Many people, uh, things happen in their life, they lose loved ones, and they become bitter against God. Amen. They become bitter and lose their souls behind bitterness because they blame God for everything. Listen, when God gave that rule not to eat of that tree, he meant that. And so now it's appointed to man once to die. Amen. You see? And so we can't get bitter against God. If you're mad at anybody, get mad at Adam and Eve. Get mad at mankind. God has nothing to do with the shape of this world, what shape it's in. You see? It's our decisions. We make the choices. We plant tomatoes and then get mad when tomatoes grow. We put that seed in the ground. We reap what we sow. And then we get mad at God for reaping what we've sown. Amen. No, we better learn to take it, you see. Mm -hmm. We better know when we plant <laughs> peas, that's what we're going to get is peas, you see. Now let's go real quick to the 16th chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. Now it's a lot that's going on uh, in between <laughs> these few chapters. Uh, one of the next things that happened, of course... And I, I encourage you to go and read through that uh, from the 12th chapter on to the 20th chapter. Uh, you see all of David's sins, all of it just being thrown in his face. That one thing that he did, all of it just being, being just coming back on him. And one of the things that happened, of course, David had a few wives. And by these different wives, he had children. And so one of his children, one of his sons, saw a daughter from another wife that he had. And he wanted to sleep with the daughter, even though that was his half-sister, you see. And so he went and slept uh, with the girl. Basically, he raped the girl. And then, and then didn't marry her, just threw her on out of the house, see. 
And so uh, the girl's brother, who they had the same mother, got mad about it and, and then basically went and killed the boy. So you got David's own children sleeping with one another and then getting upset about it and, and then killing each other. So one of the sons have killed another son. Just like God said, that sort of never leave your house, you see. And so, and then on top of that, you got all kind of rebellion going on. The very son uh, that killed Absalom, which is, was his name, that killed the other son, David's other son, uh, he takes off running because he's scared that David's going to kill him. And David welcomes him back and says, no, I'm not against you. Uh, everything is good. I understand you did what you did or whatever, but I forgive you, you see. He was a merciful man. But this same son turns around and runs David out of the kingdom and basically takes over the kingdom. So now David is fleeing from the very son that he gave mercy to. Let me tell you something. If you want to know something about life, you read about David's life and see all of the things. You don't see uh, from, from beginning to end so much go on in one man's life than David in this Bible. From beginning to end, you see God work more and deal more with him in his life than any other prophet in his Bible, you see. From beginning to end, you see, we know about David's childhood. We know about him, you know, slaying a giant. And we know about Saul chasing him down. And we know about the mercy that he, he showed Saul. And I mean, everything that you want to know about life, you can find it in David's life, you see, if you would just pay attention to it. And so now, David's not upset. He just leaves. He's sad that this is taking place. But he leaves the kingdom. Now, let's think about something here, about what's going on here. We're talking about the same David that slew Goliath. And here he is now running from his own son. Everybody get that? Why wouldn't he just stand up and say, look, chump, I whoop Goliath. I've, I've slew bears, I've slew lions, and you think you're going to come up in here and try to run it? it was it that David was, had, you know, uh, just lost his heart and, and just didn't know how to fight anymore? No. David knew that this was part of his reaping what he sowed, and so he took it. He didn't say, well, look, I ain't got to take this. I'm the king. I, I gave birth to you. I'm not going to let you run me out of my own kingdom. And he could have very well withstood that. But he understood mm -hmm. God is behind all of this. And really, I'm the one that brought it all on. And so what do I look like going against, you know, the very seeds that I've planted? You see? All right, let's go ahead and keep re Let's read. We're in the 16th chapter. And David is fleeing now. He's running. The 16th chapter, we're going to start reading at verse 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemaiah, the son of Gera. Uh, he came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at the, all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shemaiah, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. You see, now this was somebody that, that was kin to Saul. He didn't like the idea that David was who he was and, you know, was probably bitter because Saul died and all of this. All right, let's keep reading here. Verse 8, the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Verse 9, Then said Abisha, Abisha, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Okay. Now, it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't like David and them were, had just all of a sudden lost heart. They were still mighty men of valor. And so one of his servants said, Why are you letting this man do this? Let's just kill him and just get him on out of the way. We ain't got to take this. And that's, the, that's the mindset of a lot of people. When they begin to reap what they sow, I don't have to put up with this. I, I'm a child of the king. I, I'm the head and not the tail. You see how that fit now? 
We better learn to suffer if we're going to reign with Christ, especially if we're suffering because of our own deeds. You see. All right. Verse 10. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? He's saying God told him to do this. And so if God told him to do it, who am I to withstand God? Oh, that just changed our whole mindset, don't it? David knew God, God have allowed this thing to take place. And God told him to do it. And so if I go against him and cut his head off, I'll be going against God. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to take my punishment for what I've done. I'm going to take this chastisement. That's right. You see? All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 11, And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. And it may be that the Lord will look upon my affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. In other words, if I just go ahead and get my whooping out of the way, maybe the Lord will be merciful. Many of you remember me telling that story when we were little. Uh, mama would whip us and I would be standing there. I couldn't stand to see her whooping anybody else because I knew mine was coming. And so I would jump in and try to get mine out of the way, you see. Because <laughs> my thinking was, well, if I jump in and get mine out of the way, you know, if I jump in, you know, after she gave him a few licks, maybe I'll only get a few licks. But of course, that didn't deter her. She was just whooping us both at the same time and pushing one of us out of the way, you see. So, uh, you know, you, you just ha you have to learn if, if you're going to grow in the Lord, this has to be our attitude towards the chastisement of the Lord. If we're going to grow in the Lord, we have to learn to receive God's correction. David was a man after God's own heart because he received correction from God. You see, he received that correction. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 13, and as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. You see that? And so you think about what David is going through, the humility and that humiliation, rather, that he's going through as well. That here he is, he's killed giants, he's killed bears and lions, and he was a mighty man of valor, and the anointing of God was upon him to slay whoever. But at that same time, he allowed his enemies to curse him because he understood that it was God's will, you see. He understood that it was God's way of chastising him. It was God's way of humbling him. God will allow us to go through things to humble us. You see? But see, when we don't receive correction from God, we, we're not humble. And so the next time when the devil put that, uh, that temptation in front of us, we're going to bite it. And we'll keep falling into the same sin over and over again. Why? Because we didn't learn our lesson the first time. Why didn't we learn? Because we didn't receive correction when God sent it. And so my prayers is that we will learn to receive God's correction. It's for us to grow by. So my prayers, let's, let's continue to grow. Let's receive God's correction. Amen. All right. Amen. If we don't have any questions or comments, we want to say again, we thank you all for... Uh, joining. We thank you all for listening. We pray that something was said that will help you, uh, that will help you in your walk with the Lord. We pray that this ministry will continue to be a blessing to you. And we pray that uh, God will continue to use this ministry to open up your eyes to his truth, to give you more understanding of his word. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and we'll close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we've had to get in your word, to learn more about you, Lord, Lord, to learn more of your ways. And God, we pray that uh, the word that we've heard today will sink deep into our hearts. Lord, help us to uh, 
to be able to accept correction, Lord, when you bring correction to us, we thank you so much for loving us enough, Lord, to correct us. And Lord, we ask that you help us to walk in humility, Lord. Help us to see ourselves according to your word, Lord. Not comparing ourselves with different people and what they're doing, Lord, but, con but looking to you, Lord, as our perfect example. Help us to observe ourselves in the word, Lord. Help us to see ourselves, Lord. Help us to acknowledge our shortcomings, our wrongdoings, our iniquities, Lord, our sins. Help us to acknowledge those things. And Lord, right now we come confessing to you, Lord, asking that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we continue to confess our sins to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>